basically melee took place in a village and there had been a CIA report that there, were, there was, there was going to be a, a company of, of North Vietnamese regulars. We were fighting a guerrilla war against an enemy that was not wearing uniform, uh, did other things a day, hit us at night with terror attacks, uh, language difficulties, cultural difficulties. And these guys got to Vietnam. They were a, a, a badly organized, badly trained unit. Uh, they got to Vietnam. They thought they were fighting communists. They got there and by, they began operations in January of 68. And by March 15th of 1968, they'd lost maybe uh, out of a 100-man company, maybe 15, 20, some dead, mostly wounded, seriously, from landmines, snipers, bungee pits. They would fall into a pit mm -hmm. with poison bungee sticks, all this horrible stuff. Never saw the enemy. They began to increasingly get violent. So this company was frustrated. They were told the next day was, there, there was a CIA report that there was going to be the 48th North Vietnamese, or 480th North Vietnamese Battalion was going to be in this village. I mean, look, they toked all night. Mm -hmm. And the uh, senior uh, NCOs and officers drank all night, but they got up at 3.30, put their weapons on, and the defending democracy, you got to give them to do, went to be killed, they want to pay back. Instead, they find 555 is probably the best number, 550-something, men, women, and children in this village, and they kill them all, or most of them, 99%, 95% of them, put them in ditches and shoot. Here's how they reported it. They reported that they killed 128 VC were killed in a big combat fight, three weapons captured. And it was front page, that battle was, the Milai was a front page story in the New York Times a day or two later as a great victory. I ended up, the book, the book I wrote about Milai, I ended up the last line of the book said, those who did the killing were as much victims as those they killed in a very profound way. They were all really ruined. I still hear from a couple, they're always, it's drugs, booze, destruction. I mean, you can't go through what they went through. You're writing about the Pentagon for a few years, and then uh, in the fall of 1969, you get a tip, basically about a, an army lieutenant named William Cowley and court martial proceedings about the start or something. It's so interesting because it wasn't said that way. There was nothing, the name Cowley wasn't mentioned, officer wasn't mentioned, court martial wasn't mentioned. It took me a month to get the name Cowley, three weeks to get the name Cowley anyway. Uh -huh. I was in the Pentagon one day. I'm chasing the story. I'm nowhere. I know I have this tip, but I have no lead on it. And I see a guy that had been a colonel when I knew him in 66, 67. He'd gone to Vietnam. And so we're limping along. I'm walking down the corridor with him. He said, so what are you doing now? What's your assignment? He said, I'm working for the chief of staff. General William S. Moreland was the chief of staff. And I said, so tell me, I said, what's this about some guy shooting up a bunch of people? And he stopped, one of those magic moments. Mm -hmm. And he said, let me tell you, Hershey said, that guy, Callie, he didn't shoot anybody higher than this high. He just shot little kids. He deserves everything he gets. And, you know, I didn't say, Callie? Wow. I, I'm sure I said, <laughs> oh, okay, or whatever, you know, and, and, but I had a name. Some guy's going like this. He didn't shoot anybody higher than that. I mean, you can't make it up. I called him up. Got him on the phone and said, oh, casually, I'm going to be flying out to the West Coast. I want to stop. Plane stops in Salt Lake in the morning. Can I see you? He said, sure, very polite. And, uh, of course, that wasn't true in the sense. I mean, in any <laughs> sense, I was going directly there, and I right. bought a ticket. And before going, I went to the Army library, military library, and I printed out about five or six of his last decisions. So I read them on the plane. So when I meet him, I start talking about one of the cases. What was the argument? What did he think about it? And he thinks, I'm sure he thinks I'm probably the nicest young man he's ever met. You know, I'm, I'm basically flattering him. So we had this conversation, and eventually he, he, he makes the case for Cowley, that it was innocent and all that. And most importantly, he pulled out a piece of paper. And he wouldn't let me look at it, but he left it. He, he was reading from it upside down, and I had a conversation with this guy while copying the first 10 or 12 lines upside down. And the first line said, uh, uh, the Army holds that Lieutenant C William L. Calley, Jr. was guilty of the premeditated murder of 111, it said, oriental human beings, oriental human beings. Uh, when I wrote that the first time, it was gone. They immediately rewrote I wrote it in one of the first stories. It was gone in the indictment. But I saw it. I saw it. So I had the story. I knew I had a story. Mm -hmm. 
it's, it's probably 30, 40 miles in, in diameter. It's a big base. And I initially just went to every brig, every jail, and I would pull up in front of it. I did, there were about seven or eight. I went to three or four before I gave it up. I'd pull up in front, right in the commanding officer's spot, jumped out, and some, office, some sergeants watching me storm in, get me Bill Kelly, right out here. Sarge, get him out, you know, with some command presence. And in each case, who, what? And finally, after a lot of that, I realized he wasn't there. And sometime late morning, I went to the legal office, and there was a warrant officer in charge. And I went in, and this time I thought I'd be more direct. I said, my name is Hirsch, I'm a reporter. I'm looking, I want to talk about uh, uh, William Kelly. And he said, who? I said, Lieutenant William Kelly. He's being held up for murder, serious charges, very serious business. He said, hold it a second. And, he, and I said, what, what's going on? He said, uh, he, he was very polite. He said, I'm under instructions anytime anybody asks for Kelly uh, to call the colonel. I, and I said, OK. And I said, see you. He said, no, you can't leave. And I said, I'm out of here. And I ran and jumped in my car and drove off. He couldn't do anything about it. I just, but I knew I had Cali. And it was late afternoon by now. Everybody was at work. I figured he's got no job. He's hanging around. So I went into the side door, went up and down three floors, nobody. And I went, I remember crawling underneath from one side to the other side rather than walk around. It was one of those offices that had a double door. The bottom was, uh, was closed. Oh, the uh -huh. And I snuck down under it, and I went to the other side. And there in the corner in the second floor was somebody sleeping. So I went and kicked the bunk. I said, wake up, Callie. Huh? Huh? He says, some guy gets up. He's got a long Polish name. <laughs> it isn't Callie, some young blonde kid. So what do you do? He said, nothing. I said, no job. He said, well, I'm the mail clerk. I said, oh, you sort the mail for everybody? He said, yeah, I, every day. That's about the only job I have. So. Ever hear the name Callie, William Callie? He said, you mean the guy that shot up everybody? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he said, yeah, he doesn't stay here, though. He never stayed here. All his mail is packaged by me, and I deliver it to another headquarters. And he, I drove him over there, and he showed me the guy he delivered to, and I grabbed the guy. His name is Smitty. And I, get, I go into the, where the battalion headquarters. And he's the mail clerk. And I say to the sergeant, get Smitty out here with my suit on. They think he's in trouble again. He gets in my car. I said, you're not in trouble. I just, I just need to know about Cali. Where is he? <laughs> and the same thing. He says, I don't know. The only thing we have is his file. And, and I said, go get it. And he said, OK. Came back in five minutes later with a file. He had it in his, in his blouse, opened up, gave it to me. The first page was what I'd seen the day before in the, uh, in the lawyer's office. I'd seen it the day before, the same charge sheet. Right. I copied it. I, I didn't make a Xerox. I didn't want to get him in trouble. But he was living off base. I got the address, and I went off base and found him. He was He was actually parked by this point in senior officer's quarters. I had to knock on doors half the night to get him. I found him. I found him. No problem. I found him. Would have knocked all day. It's a great story. Oh, it's an incredible story. It is a great story.